Good morning. Welcome. I'm so glad that you joined us online. I know that you would love to be in the house with us today, but I, I just want you to know that, listen, even though we're still scattered, we are still one church. If you are, are signing in, you're tuned in, you're online, you are family, we're part of one family. I, I just pray that today that you feel connected uh, and that you feel loved because, because you are. Listen, before we jump in, now's a great time to grab your phone or your iPad and to, to open up the Capital Church app. If you don't have the app, you can download that at your app store and it really will work as kind of a worship guide for you today. And on that app, you can find information about Capital Church and our upcoming events. Uh, but there's also message notes in there to help you follow along. Uh, and, and also in the connections section, you'll see a tab that says connect with us. And that's there to help you do exactly that, uh, to help you connect, whether you are watching with us for the very first time, or if you, uh, there's a next step that you are ready to take in your spiritual journey, or you have a, a request, a prayer request that you'd like us to pray with you about, uh, that's the place to do that, and we would love uh, to help you with that. So let me ask you this, you ever go home with a different girl than you brought to the dance? Yeah, me, me neither. I, I don't know why that would happen. I feel like if that were to happen, there would have to be all kinds of things that would have gone sideways to ever result in that. I, I imagine that, that the way that would, would play out is probably something the way 2020 is playing out. You know what I mean? Like, like it, every morning we are waking up to a different world than the one that we started this dance with. I mean, just so much has changed and so much is still changing. Now, now, some of it is good, but, but not all of it. I, and so I felt like it was important for us to lean in to this season of change that we are all in uh, and to spend the summer talking about how to respond well to the changes in our world uh, and, and in our own lives, our own situations, and how to become agents for, of positive change in our world. And so today is part two of a three-part mini-series, uh, uh, a series within the message series. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm taking three Sundays uh, to talk about three right responses to change uh, in our world. And last week, uh, we said that it's always right to fight against change that diminishes God's image in you. If you missed that talk, uh, I encourage you to look that up on the app or uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, I really believe that this is a, that's an important message for the church in our time, so I encourage you to look at that. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to talk about how to navigate change that you can't control because some change is inevitable. Uh, and by trying to fight it, uh, we're just fighting against uh, change that, that can be good if we learn to navigate it well. But today, I, I want to talk about another kind of, another response to change. Today, I want to talk about what it looks like to instigate change that makes earth look more like heaven. To instigate change that makes earth look more like heaven. You know, there are some changes that we've got to fight for because if we don't do something, they're just not going to change. Some changes uh, just won't happen unless we make them happen. Uh, Jesus made this his main message uh, when he said, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near, and so repent, turn around, and believe the good news. Uh, God the Father, uh, he knew that change was needed on earth, and so he sent Jesus to inaugurate his kingdom here on earth. When we talk about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is it's wherever, and it's not a location, but it's, it's wherever uh, God reigns. It's where he is by his people recognized as king, where he uh, and his word is recognized as the way to live. Uh, the kingdom of God is born to earth in people's hearts. It's when we turn our hearts to Jesus in faith that the kingdom of God enters into us kind of like a seed, like a small seed. Uh, it's small at first, but then life bursts through, uh, like light breaking uh, into darkness, and it grows within us, and, 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 and it grows in you, and it grows wherever you are, and it, 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 there's evidence of the kingdom of God growing in you. Uh, that seed becomes fruit. And that fruit is born and it brings life and it brings good things into your life and into your family and into your neighborhood and your city. And in our society, it begins to look a little like heaven. 
Well, this, Jesus said, that is what God is up to on the earth. And Jesus, he taught his disciples to pray, to pray for the kingdom of God to come. And he defined it like this. It's when God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And he also taught us to act. He said, look, if you want to enter it, if you want to experience the kingdom, then you must change. There's another translation of this verse that says it this way, change the way you think and act and believe the good news. Like if we are willing to stop, if we're willing to listen, to consider, to change the way we think and we act, then we become useful uh, as a part of God's mission to become agents of change in our world. At one point, Jesus, look, unless you change and receive God's kingdom in a humble, hopeful, trusting way, like a child, you'll never enter it. But when you are willing to be transformed by Jesus, here's the promise, you will become transformational in our world. Uh, one day, Jesus was teaching about the kingdom of God, and he said this, he said, from the time that John the Baptist began preaching until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. But he said, don't miss, this is also true, violent people are attacking it. Meaning this, like, that God's kingdom, it, it's explosive in power, and uh, it, it, it's, it's a breaking in, uh, and it's growing, it's a growing force on the earth. And all uh, who allow it to enter and experience, and you take hold of it and become a part of God's kingdom, uh, you, along with the kingdom, are advancing and changing the culture bit by bit. But understand that that advance will not be unopposed, because the kingdom of God and the people of God are under perpetual attack spiritually, and even by earthly violence. So instigating change that makes earth look more like heaven, it, it won't be easy. But it's the new kind of world that's worth fighting for. So the question then becomes, how do we know that we're fighting for the right things? How do we know that we're instigating change that really makes earth look more like heaven? Because there's a lot of fighting going on in the world, you've probably noticed. And very little of it is making earth look anything like heaven. When Jesus was on earth, he did a lot of, of fighting. Uh, but the change that he fought for, it was always about advancing God's kingdom. There are several stories that kind of illustrate uh, this and the way he did that. But the most vivid one is found in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. It shows us how Jesus fought for change that made earth look more like heaven and, and, and how we can do it as well. Uh, we read in Mark chapter 11, verse 15, that Jesus entered the temple and he began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple. And he overturned tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written that my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? Well, the chief priests and the teachers, they, they heard this and they began to plot. They began, began to looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. Now, what we need to understand uh, 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 about this in order to understand the significance of this scene is that uh, when it says here that Jesus entered the temple, it's referring to the whole temple grounds, like the front door, the first lobby, not the temple building itself that was set in the middle of these grounds. See, the building, it was small by comparison to the temple grounds. Uh, it, has, it was made up of just two, two rooms, uh, the holy place and the most holy place. Now, the, the most holy place was where the presence of God dwelt on earth, and only the high priest could enter into that room. The rest of the temple building was called the, the, uh, the holy place, and only priests were allowed to go in there. Everyone else who came to worship God was outside the temple building. The, 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 the temple grounds, these were made up of, it was massive, and it was made up of, uh, of several courtyards that were, were kind of designated uh, and dedicated areas for segregated groups of people. So right outside the, the temple building door, uh, there was the altar. And then you had the first courtyard. 
And that first courtyard was called the court of Israel, and only Jewish men were allowed to get that close to God. Uh, Only the Jewish men were allowed to be in that courtyard. Now, beyond a a, a really thick, uh, tall brick wall, there was another courtyard. That was called the court of women. Uh, And Jewish women were allowed to go there, no closer, but that was, uh, it was only for Jewish women to be there in that courtyard. Now, uh, attached to that that Uh, courtyard, there was a a small room called the Court of Lepers. And that was for everybody with coronavirus. Uh, And then beyond that, there was like a large foyer that went around every, uh, all of the space. And that was uh, just kind of like this area where just Jewish people were allowed to go to congregate, to pass back and forth to talk. Uh, that space was, was uh, walled off by these super tall screens so that nobody on the outside of these screens could look in to see what was happening in that section. Now, everything that was outside of these screens, it was still in the temple, in these, this really massive courtyard, uh, it was called the Court of Gentiles. Now, this was the place where those who were non-Jewish people were allowed to go and to worship God. It was the only place that they could go and to worship God. If you enter the temple, as it says, Jesus entered the temple, this is what you entered into. You walked into the Gentile court. Now, uh, Jesus enters into the Gentile court, and, and, and what he sees, this only place that the Gentiles can go to worship God, what he sees is it, it looks like a, like a Middle Eastern bazaar. The temple leaders, the, the religious authorities, they had set up a shop there. And they were selling animals because it was the Passover. And so pilgrims from all over the world were coming and they had to make a sacrifice. So they were selling animals for that sacrifice. And they were changing currency, foreign currency, into temple currency so that they could pay the temple tax. So imagine this this scene. You're a Gentile. You're already a racial outsider in this culture. The very closest that you can get to God is the overflow room. And not because you were late to church that day, but because of the skin that you were born in. And you're there and you want to worship God, but, but right there in the middle of, you, of that room that, 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 that's there for you, it's like a flea market going on. And you're trying to pray, but there's birds rattling in the cages, and there's, there's sheep poop on the ground, and there's, uh, there's, there's people screaming at the top of their lungs over exchange rates. Well, Jesus sees this. He enters the temple. He sees this and he says, this has to change now. Now, Jesus, being a Jewish man, understand that he didn't have to do anything. He had the right to just enter into the temple grounds and walk right through the Gentile court and, and go right past those screens into the foyer and, uh, and then go right past the, the sick people and beyond the women's court and go right in to the court of Israel and worship God right there up close. It was his, follow me, track me here, it was his privilege as a Jewish male. Learn with me here. Let's learn together to just keep on going to just go to the people that were just like him and just worship there. Now, this privilege that Jesus had, he he was just born a Jewish man. This temple system, it had been established long before he was born. Uh, He didn't sign up for this. This privilege was given to him. But just like he did with his divine privilege, Jesus did not consider his Jewish male privilege something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he understood the purpose of his privilege. He used his privilege powerfully for the sake of others. Uh, You see, Jesus is on the side of the ones outside. Uh, He was always on the side of the ones outside. This story is just one example of that. Jesus often fought for people during his ministry. He fought for the racially marginalized. He fought for women. He fought for widows and orphans. He he fought for the poor and the hungry, for the elderly and for children. Jesus fought for the criminalized. He said, what you do for those in prison, you're doing for me. He fought for the police, praying one time, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He fought for sinners, tax collectors, adulterers, prostitutes. He fought for the the righteous, uh, the, the the, the ones that the righteous wanted to cut off. It's uncomfortable but it's unavoidable that every kind of person that we have ever villainized, that we speak against, that we marginalize, Jesus fought for them. 
Jesus was on the side of those on the outside, all the way to the cross. Because you see, you don't confront injustice. You don't stand to toe, toe-to-toe with a corrupt system without paying for it. But Jesus came to fight for change. He came to fight for the kind of change that makes earth look more like heaven. You see, John tells us what heaven will look like. He says, I looked and there was before me a great multitude that no one could count from every night, nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Every kind of person, every shade, all equal in their position at the feet of Jesus. You see, this is biblical equity. Uh, everyone equal, the marginalized are, 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 are dignified, the privileged are humble, and no one is more honored than God. You see, equity isn't biblical. It isn't biblical equity if it doesn't end in glory given to Jesus. You see, if our quest for equity is, is really nothing more than about human ethics, then it's well, it's just another attempt at the Tower of Babel. <laughs> and, and I'm afraid it, it won't last no matter how much progress it seems like we're making. Biblical equity is what we fight for. Biblical equity is, is, is our quest. It's you and, and your natural enemy, the one who is other, standing side by side in recognition of God and worship of Jesus. That's heaven coming earth. And the gospel is the only message that assures us because of Jesus, equity, true equity is possible. And so the gospel calls us that until that day, let us together here and now instigate change that makes earth look more like heaven. Okay, so let's walk away today with four things four things that Jesus did to fight for the ones on the outside. And let's ask the Holy Spirit to show us what it looks like for us in our context to take action like Jesus did. Number one, uh, Jesus entered their space. You know, there's there's two common responses to injustice today that I I see. Neither of them are biblical, nor are they helpful. Uh, And and none of them are making earth look uh, anything like Heaven. And the first one of those responses, common responses, is the, is the cancel culture. You know, get rid of everything and everyone that, that doesn't agree with me. It's the worst kind of intolerance because it, it, it ends conversation, it denies mercy, it closes the door to reconciliation. Uh, and on top of all of that, Jesus warned us. He warned us measure, <laughs> the measure that we judge with is the measure that's going to be used to judge us when it actually counts. Instead, Jesus, his way is redemption, not reduction. We can do better than that. The second uh, common response to injustice is the the what about gang. (laughs) Uh, You know, black lives matter. Yeah, but what about all lives? Women are underpaid, but yeah, what about that time that my cousin didn't get the job because of affirmative action? Uh, Young people are leaving the church. Yeah, but what about the old hymns that I miss? You see, the what about gang never really listens to the ones outside. Uh, They just wait to say, what about me? And intentionally or not, and I really believe with all my heart that it's not intentional, but it's still happening. Intentionally or not, they're dismissing real pain of hurting people. And we can do better. When Jesus entered the temple He didn't uh, hurry through the Gentile court to get to his space. He saw the injustice that was there and he decided to do something. Uh, Jesus, he he didn't, uh, you know, he wasn't looking for trouble, but he didn't look away when he saw it. We can do uh, like Jesus did when we enter the space of the ones on the outside. And it's a matter of asking, uh, you know, where would Jesus be? What would Jesus do? That's a good question, but it it should start with this question. Where would Jesus be? Like I walk into a room, who in this room would Jesus be talking to? Who would he be concerned with taking up the side of? 
Who would Jesus be, be getting coffee with so that, so, that, so that he could listen and learn and understand? Who would Jesus be loving, respecting, serving? Who would he be flipping tables for? Uh, when you go where Jesus went, you'll be where Jesus is. The second uh, thing that, that, that Jesus did is he cleaned the house. Now, I think it's really important for us to understand that Jesus did not lose his composure in this scene, right? Uh, he was being intentional. He intentionally used his privilege to fight for the racially and religiously marginalized. There were a number, a number of isms uh, that Jesus and the first Christians denounced uh, in their world. Racism, sexism, ageism, classism. And Jesus' brother James, he gave them all one name. He said, it's all favoritism. In, in the book of James, he said, if you show special attention to a man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but you say to a poor man, you stand over there, or sit on the floor by my feet, then have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Look, uh, he said, look, if you've given honor and benefit to one, but you've marginalized and insulted the other, uh, then, then it's a sin. We read that, that, that Jesus drove out and that he, he overturned. He, he drove out and he overturned the things that were, were, were favoring the ones on the inside and marginalizing the, the ones on the outside. You know, I, I can only tell you for, for our church, you know, we, we know that there will always be some obstacles to, to connecting uh, here at Capitol for, for every person. And it kind of should be that way, right? Because no healthy church should ever be 100% catered toward one people group. That's not healthy. The question is, uh, are the obstacles equal for every person? So we ask, is it more difficult for a, a black person to, to serve and to lead here than it is for a white person? Uh, is it easier for an older person to connect uh, and to worship here than it is for a young person? If it is, then let's drive out those obstacles. Let's overturn those tables till it looks more like heaven in here. Uh, as individuals, we have to ask, do I honor and, and, and benefit people of, of my shade more than people of another shade? Uh, do I honor and benefit people my gender more than the other gender? Do I honor and benefit people uh, who are my age more than uh, those who are older or younger than me? It's a really good thing. It's painful, but it's a really good thing to expose favoritism when you see it, especially if it's in your heart. And then to clean the house. Uh, the, 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 the third thing that we see Jesus doing is stand guard. After Jesus has, has entered their space and he's driven out uh, the problem, we read that Jesus would not permit anyone to carry their stuff through the temple. Jesus stood guard to protect against new injustices, corrupting, uh, clogging up this now cleaned up house. So what's that mean? Like, like, well, for us as individuals, uh, it means guarding your heart and guarding your home, first of all. Like asking, what messages, what entertainment am I allowing to pass through? What vocabulary, what terms get out of my mouth? What jokes do I, do, do I, I tell? What jokes do I laugh at? Are they racist? Are they demeaning toward women? Disrespectful toward men? Uh, it, it means guarding your heart and guarding your home, but it also means speaking up at work, at school, wherever you play, to stand guard, to not permit anyone to drag their junk through unchecked. Uh, this is, I think, the, uh, the most difficult part of what Jesus did. Because you see, it, it, re it, it requires us to surrender the right to say, hey, I've done my part. Jesus could have flipped the tables, you know, and then just gone on his way. And we would have said, look at what Jesus did. But Jesus stayed. He stayed with them. He stayed with the marginalized to stand guard for them. As a church, as a church, I think that we do our best. 
right? To, 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 through music, uh, to think through the videos that we use, the, the design, um, the people that we platform, the voices that we promote. Because we recognize, you know, uh, don't, be, don't be deceived, the devil is in the details. And we just, we got no time for him to drag his junk through here. Now, obviously, we don't always get it right because none of us are, are, are Jesus. And that's why uh, a huge part of, of what it means to stand guard as a church and to stand guard as a community is inviting those who are often on the outside to come in, to come alongside, to help you to see what you might not see. To stand guard, it means collaboration. It means empowerment and trust. It means keeping the conversation going and keeping the heart humble. It means listening some more. It means learning more. It means staying in the fight until all are inside. Now, the, uh, the fourth thing that we see Jesus do is that he taught the good news of equity. See, Jesus wasn't on a mission. This is important, so important. Jesus wasn't on a mission to make earth look like a better earth. Jesus was on a mission to make earth look more like heaven. And so after entering their space and after driving out the problem, while standing guard, we read that it, he began to teach. And he said, look, my house is meant to be called a, ha a house of prayer for all the nations. Jesus taught about God's desire. He's, taught, he's concerned about God's desire for justice and equity. That his house, in our context, this means the church, not a building, but a group of people scattered all across the world, scattered across the capital region, us, the people, that his, his people would be a place where people of all nation and race and gender and age and class uh, could connect personally and intimately with God. And when Jesus taught this good news, notice he also warned, he warned that there's no place in God's kingdom for systems that keep the outside outside. And there's no place for people who perpetuate those systems either. And so let's teach each other the good news. But let's also admonish each other to do better. Let's teach uh, those that we disciple. Let's teach our children. Let's teach our world that, look, the deepest reason that racism and sexism and, and classism and ageism is, is, is wrong and evil and unacceptable is that God has made all people in his image. And he wants all people, every person, to know his love for them. And so he fought. He fought sin and evil and death itself in order to make the way wide for all people to come to him. Let's teach people that God loved the world so much, the whole world, that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Jesus, he flipped tables for us. He came to us when we were on the outside, when we were lost in sin. He removed that barrier between us and God. And he gave us his spirit to keep us, to teach us, to lead us. He brought us from the outside to the inside so that we will join him in the mission to go after the one, to go after the ones who are still outside. So let us enter their space. The ones who are on the outside, the ones who are marginalized, the ones who are other than us. Let's, let's enter into their space humbly. Let's clear the house of injustice. Let's stand guard of our hearts and our homes. Let's teach the gospel until heaven looks, uh, till earth looks more like heaven. I, listen, if, if you this morning are outside of, uh, of a relationship with God, uh, I, I want you to know that you don't have to be. Jesus has already paid the price for you. You belong, if you put your faith in him, when you begin a relationship with him, you belong to him and nothing that you can do can change his mind about you. 
he thought you were worth fighting for in the beginning. While you were still running away from him, he was running toward you. He thought that you were worth dying for. When you call on Jesus, if you want to enter into that relationship with him, uh, the New Testament tells us how. It says that if you, will, if you will put your faith in him, believe that he died for you, that he rose from the dead, and you'll say, Jesus, I invite you to be the leader of my life. The New Testament tells us that if you will do that, you'll say, I believe in you and I trust you, that your sin will be forgiven and he will give you his spirit to walk with you through this life. It's something that you can do right here and right now. If you want that, will you just pray this prayer along with me? Jesus, thank you. Thank you for coming to earth, for entering into my space. Even when I was running from you, even when I was outside, you came after me to bring me to you. I believe in you. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you rose from the dead. I've been running from you, but I'm turning around. I'm changing my direction and I'm going toward you. I invite you into my life to be the leader of my life. Thank you. Help me to follow after you. Amen. The Bible says if you prayed that prayer, the change that has happened in you spiritually, it starts just, just like a seed in the beginning. But as you continue to look for him and continue to trust in him, continue to seek to know him, to follow him, continue to take your next steps in your spiritual journey, that seed will grow and will bear fruit in your life. And even your struggles will have value. Listen, if you want to learn how to take another step, I encourage you to use that app, to use that Connect With Us tab in the app. Just fill that out and hit submit, and that will come right to me, uh, and I'll make sure to follow up with you. Thank you all so much for tuning in this morning. Uh, I pray that you have just a blessed week. I thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Uh, when you give to Capital Church, uh, you are giving, uh, as you saw in Capital News, you are giving not just to us, but you are making an impact throughout throughout the world. And so thank you for your continued faithfulness, your continued uh, uh, worship of God and worship to God with your finances. And now, uh, may the love of God, may the grace of Jesus, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God bless you. Have a great week.